Jesus. What a powerful, beautiful name. Jesus, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Savior of the world. Father, may it be our desire to praise you, to worship you with all that we are. God, remind us of that truth today, that you are the Savior, you are the King. God, I ask that you would just remind us of your presence today, that you are always with us. Be with those who maybe are dealing with some anxiety still of just the changes and transition of school and the worries of college life. Be with those who are in a time of rejoicing. May they recognize the blessings that are from above, from you. God, I ask that you would tune our ears and tune our hearts to what it is you want to speak to us this morning. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Evangels. Welcome to chapel. It's so good to see all of you who are here in person and all of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're a part of this community this morning. You know, at MACU, we are deeply committed to honoring the saints on whose shoulders we stand, the women and the men who have blessed our university over these past 70 years and help us to be where we are today. We honor them as we look to the past, but also as we look to the future. And today we are richly and deeply blessed to have the granddaughter of our third president, Forrest Robinson. He served from 1988 to 1999, was a part of significant work that happened on this campus, including the Galkey Activity Center, where many of you play volleyball and basketball. He led this university with deep integrity and is now in, in heaven with the Lord, uh, but we give thanks for his life and for his legacy. Reverend Kayla Hardin is here today from Anderson, Indiana, for our, the home of our sister school, Anderson University. She is the pastor of congregational care at the East Side Church of God. She graduated from Anderson University and then went to Fuller Seminary, where she has a Master of Divinity. She's worked in youth ministry and specifically with the Intern Academy, an organization that we partner with to send students to serve in churches and in nonprofits all across the country doing internships. She and her husband, Nathan, have two children and a deep love for the Lord. Let's give a warm Mackie welcome to Reverend Kayla Harden. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. It's still morning at 11, right? So when I was a kid, I found out pretty early on that I did not have very good vision. I was in glasses very early, and I ended up having contact lenses by the time I was 10. And I hated every minute of it. I wanted so badly to have perfect vision, to be able to see everything clearly. Now, if you've never worn contact lenses before, you might not realize that the proper care for your contacts is to take them out every night, to soak them in solution so that they get cleaned and your eyes get a break. And, and I religiously followed that when I was younger. I took my contacts out, I soaked them overnight, every single night, without fail. So you can imagine my surprise when one morning I wake up and everything is clear. I could see. Now, before you go thinking I'm telling you a miraculous healing story, there's something else you should know about me. I do weird stuff in my sleep. I talk in my sleep. I sometimes yell in my sleep. One time, I scared my husband when he woke up to find me standing in the middle of the bed. <laughs> so instead of my vision being healed like I had hoped, I had gotten up in my sleep put my contact lenses in, went to bed, and hadn't woken up to the whole experience. So you can imagine how disappointed I was to realize that my vision wasn't perfect, that it was still flawed and off. And I think most of us, we go around in our daily lives not really understanding or realizing that our vision is off. 
We'll get caught up in our life. You might get caught up in classes and writing papers or watching YouTube or TikTok, and you don't notice when your vision has started to shift. We go through life thinking we can see clearly, but in reality, our vision is lacking or distorted. So this morning, I want to share with you a story about a man who who knew that his vision was off, who knew that his vision was lacking, but his encounter with Jesus gave him sight. And then a group of people who thought they could see clearly, but in reality, they were blind to what truly mattered. This story takes place in John chapter 9, if you want to follow along in your Bible. It's in the midst of Jesus' ministry. He's been teaching and healing. He's been challenged by religious leaders. He's even even been accused of of being a Samaritan and demon-possessed. Our story begins with Jesus encountering a man who was born blind. You see, many uh, Jewish rabbis in this time, they had this direct cause-effect relationship between sin and suffering. And, And so they taught people that if you were suffering, it was because of something you did. It was because of the sin you committed. And so when Jesus approached this man who had been born blind, it was no surprise when his disciples turned to him and asked, Whose fault is this man's blindness? Was it his fault? Was he preemptively punished for something that he did wrong? Or was it his mother? Did she do something wrong when she was pregnant with him? Or was it his father? Whose fault is it? Why is he blind and who is to blame? So you can imagine their surprise when Jesus responded, it's no one's fault. No one is to blame. But this happened so that we can reveal the glory of God. We are here in circumstances like this to reveal the glory of God. As long as it is day, we must do the work of the one who sent me. Soon night will be here and no one can work at night. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Disciples all looked around very confused as they processed his words. I mean, it's true. Back then, you couldn't work at night. You could only work in the day. That's common sense. But today's the Sabbath, and we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And and what did Jesus mean that he was the light of the world? But before they could ask any clarifying questions, Jesus spit onto the ground and made a mud paste uh, substance. Then he took a handful of this mud paste substance and he wiped it on the eyes of the blind man. Now you can imagine how confused this guy must have been. But he had spent his lifetime in blind isolation, relying on on the kindness of strangers just to eat and survive. Jesus told him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I can imagine that this man was a little bit confused, but, but there's something about how Jesus spoke to him. Like there was authority in his tone, but there was also kindness. It was almost like Jesus understood, like he saw the loneliness and the darkness that had surrounded him his whole life. See, most people spoke to him with hints of, of judgment and condemnation. After all, he was blind because he deserved it. He was the one who sinned. He deserved it. He should be isolated. Because after all, it's hard to have compassion on someone when you think they're getting what they deserve. But even though this was a strange request, the blind man felt compelled to do it. And now scripture doesn't tell us how he he made his way to the pool, but I imagine he probably needed some help and some guidance making his way there. And then when he finally made it, I can imagine that he he stopped and, and wondered to himself, why? Why wash in this pool? Why would this time be any different? But then again, why not? What did he have to lose? So he took a deep breath and he bent down to the pool. He cupped the water in his hands and he rinsed the mud paste from his eyes. And then he blinked. What had once been a world of darkness came flooding in on a wave of bright light. 
blinking and rubbing his eyes, he saw people for the first time. He saw animals that had made the noises he had always heard. He saw the clear blue sky and the backdrop of a beige Jerusalem. He could see. He could contain himself no longer, and he began to shout and jump up and down, his enthusiasm drawing attention from a crowd of neighbors. A few of them recognized him, and they began whispering to one another, Hey, isn't, isn't that the guy who used to sit over there and, and beg? There's no way, he whispered another. I mean, he probably just looks like him. I don't know. I've seen this guy here for years. I am pretty sure it's him, said another. The formerly blind man heard their whispers and with a broad grin on his face said, Oh, no, it's me. I was the blind man that sat right over there. A crowd was starting to gather upon hearing the commotion. Confusion broke out as they heard his claim. How, they asked, how is it that you can see? I, I was sitting in my normal spot when this group of men walked by. I heard one of them ask another, probably their leader or their teacher, who was to blame for me being blind. And the teacher, I think his name was Jesus, he made mud and he put it on my eyes. And then he told me to wash here in the pool of Siloam, and I did, and now I can see, he exclaimed. The crowd exploded into conversation. Many were amazed, and everyone was curious. Some spoke up and asked, where is he? Where did he go? But the formerly blind man could only shrug his shoulders and say, I don't know. But this response only agitated the crowd more. I mean, this was not an ordinary occurrence, and they deserved answers. So they took the man to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they would know not only what to do, but also how he had been healed. See, at this point, the Pharisees were becoming uncomfortably familiar with Jesus, with his teachings, and with his claims about himself. He was a hard man to pin down, but, but this situation, this could be their chance to find that condemning flaw. You see, violating the Sabbath was a big deal, especially to the Pharisees. They developed many rules about what constituted work on the Sabbath. And if they could prove that Jesus had worked on the Sabbath, that he had violated it, then, then they could trap him. So one of the Pharisees began the interrogation. Tell me, he said, exactly how you came to receive your sight. Once again, the blind man, began, once again, the blind man recounted his experience. He put mud on my eyes, he said, for what felt like the thousandth time, and I washed, and now I see. See, the Pharisees exploded, this man can't be from God. He violated the Sabbath. No one who is from God violates the Sabbath. But there were a few among them who voiced opposition. But, but wait a minute. How could, how could he heal this man if he's not from God? How could he do that? I mean, we can't even do that. Finding no agreement amongst themselves, they turn to the man and, and they ask him what he thought about Jesus. So he replied, he is a prophet. Well, this set them off again as they refused to acknowledge or accept it. So instead, they changed focus, seeking to prove that it was all a hoax. He was probably not even blind in the first place. He was just planted in the audience. So they decided to call in his parents to testify. Now, his parents were scared. You see, the synagogue was both the center of religious and social life. They knew that one wrong answer would get them kicked out, and, and that didn't just mean that they had to go find another church. No, they wouldn't be allowed to worship with any of their friends. They would be cut off from their community, sometimes people even having to keep a distance away from them. And so when they were asked to verify his identity and his blindness, they did. But they said, he's an adult. Ask him, we don't know how he was healed. Once again, the Pharisees brought in the formerly blind man for questioning. Tell the truth, they said. Don't offend God further by lying to us. We know that this man is a sinner. 
the Pharisees spat at the formerly blind man. Look, he said, frustration evident in his voice. Whether or not he is a sinner, I don't know. But what I do know is that I was blind, but now I see. Several Pharisees ground their teeth in frustration. What did he do to you, they asked again. How did he do it? The formerly blind man lost all patience at this, and he even got a little bit snarky with them. I have already told you what happened. You're not listening to the truth, only what you want to hear. Do you want me to tell you again? Why? Why should I tell you? Do you want to be his disciples too? At this, their anger reached a boiling point, and they began hurling insults at him. You're the one who is his disciple. We're disciples of Moses, who we know that God spoke to. We don't even know who, where this guy is from, they retorted. Oh, really? The man replied, that's remarkable. You don't even know where he comes from, and he opened my eyes. We all know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but to the godly person who does his will. No one has ever heard of this happening before. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Rage consumed the Pharisees as they spat back. You're the one who is steeped in sin since birth. That's why you were born blind. How dare you, a sinner, try to lecture us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out of the synagogue, he searched for him and found him. There was a small crowd in the area as Jesus approached the man. Since he had been kicked out, most people had avoided him, but, but Jesus approached him. You can imagine his surprise when he approached him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And there was something familiar about Jesus' voice, but he couldn't quite place it. I mean, he'd been, seen so many people around when he was begging on the streets. Who is he? he asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. You have now seen him, Jesus responded. In fact, the one who is speaking to you now is he. The man's face lit up when he realized who he was talking to. Lord, I believe, he said, and he began to worship Jesus. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. A few Pharisees were walking by and they overheard this exchange. What? Are you calling us blind? We can see perfectly fine. We know the Torah better than anyone. We are enlightened. But Jesus said, if you were born blind, you would not now be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. When we encounter the light of the world, our perspective, our vision, it changes. What started as a question from his disciples about whose sin led to this suffering ended with Jesus not only bringing light into the life of the blind man, but revealing the blindness of those who truly believed they could see. See, in this time, the Pharisees were considered to be the experts, the teachers. According to everyone, and especially themselves, they had the sight that led them to understand what the scriptures meant. Now, sometimes when we, we read through the New Testament, I feel like we as 21st century Christians, we kind of pick on the Pharisees a little bit. It's easy for us to sit back and judge them as like the antithesis of Jesus or the bad guys of the New Testament. But I think we need to understand a little bit of why the Pharisees believed and acted as they did. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know the story of God's people, the people of Israel. After the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, after the story of Moses bringing the people out of Egypt, after Joshua conquered the land, the people of Israel struggled to stay faithful to God. So the people would fall into this pattern of, of being faithful to God and then worshiping other idols and committing these detestable acts. From the time of the judges to the decades of the monarchy, the people who were supposed to be God's chosen people cycled between faithfulness and cheating on God. Until God finally said, enough. You want to worship these fake idols? You want to disregard the Sabbath? 
If you want to sacrifice your children and abuse the poor, fine. Let these fake gods take care of you now. So God stopped rescuing the people. They were conquered, and, and some, like Daniel, were dispersed. For hundreds of years, the people of Israel had been conquered and away from their homeland. Fast forward to the time of Jesus, all the people of Israel wanted was to have the Messiah come, the guy who was promised to deliver them from the Romans. And there were several different schools of thought on, on how the Messiah would come. The Pharisees believed that the best way to prepare for the Messiah was to help the Jewish people follow the rules that God had given Moses. I mean, it makes sense after all, right? Disobedience is what gets you into the mess. Obedience is what gets you out. So they picked apart the laws and the commands, finding minute details to help everyone follow God faithfully. But what's so interesting in this story and in so many others in the New Testament is that the Pharisees were so obsessed with the law and the Sabbath that they missed the whole reason they were following it in the first place. They thought obedience was the key to bringing the Messiah, but they became so obsessed with it that they completely missed the Messiah right in front of them. They thought they could see, but in reality, they were blind to the most important thing, to the thing that they ached for, the thing they obsessed over. Earlier, I shared with you my story of having glasses and contact lenses. Now, my husband, however, he did not grow up needing glasses. He was one of those lucky few who had 20-20 vision, and he actually took a lot of pride in his good sight. He was so convinced that his vision was perfect that he put off going to the eye doctor for probably a decade. And so he decided to go in for a checkup. So you can imagine how shocked he was when he was told that he needed glasses. He still didn't believe it until he put those glasses on and found that he could see. So it was in this moment that he realized his perfect vision had been flawed the whole time. That for years he had thought he could see everything, but in reality he was missing something. See, I think this is where the Pharisees were. They thought their vision was perfect, but, but Jesus showed them how flawed it really was. So many of us go through our day-to-day -day lives focused on things that are good, things that are important. I mean, the law the Pharisees were studying, that was good. It was important. But the problem becomes when we get so focused on these things that we end up missing the most important thing. We end up missing Jesus. My hope is that you won't miss Jesus, but instead you'll, you'll let your daily encounters with him shape how you see everything and everyone around you. The worship team is going to lead us in another song, and my hope is that, that while you sing, you'll consider this story. Have you ever found yourself in the place of the Pharisees? Have you ever been so focused on things, something that might be good on its own, but it caused you to miss what was great, to miss Jesus? Or maybe like the blind man, do we let our encounter with the light of the world change how we see everything? How do we let our encounters with Jesus shape how we view the world? My hope is that today you won't miss Jesus. My hope is that following Jesus will change how you see everything. Behind your regrets and mistakes 
God, help us to see. As Pastor Kayla said, that many of us may think we have you figured out, God, that we know who you are, Jesus. But help us by your spirit to see who you really are, that you've come here to forgive and to heal and to restore and to bring us into your family. Help us to see you today and every day. We love you, we praise you, we give this all to you in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, and amen. Y'all dismiss. Thank you.